Well, let's take a look at what was going on in civil rights, specifically civil rights for African Americans in the years after World War II. In the late 40s and into the early 50s, laws against racial discrimination in employment were passed in 11 states in numerous cities. Uh, this kind of um, got its big nudge um, during the war when, as you will recall, uh, President Roosevelt had uh, sort of uh, acquiesced to the, uh, the demands of the uh, uh, Brotherhood of Pullman, uh, Pullman Car Porters and uh, A. Whitney uh, Randolph and had uh, made it illegal uh, or against government policy to discriminate in employment if you're getting defense contracts and uh, doing anything that goes across state lines. So now there are individual states passing similar laws after World War II. Part of this is the fact that World War II was uh, kind of a wake-up call for some people. Um, it was an opportunity to see, and especially once, those, uh, once the footage, the film footage and the photographs from those concentration camps became available and the Nuremberg trials were broadcast. It was a chance to see just how, how horrible it can be when a nation that is based on racist ideas is allowed to go full tilt and uh, really made some people at least stop and think. The NAACP launched a, uh, a voter registration drive in the Upper South in the late 40s. Now, the Upper South, um, that is uh, above the Deep South. That's uh, places like uh, Tennessee and Kentucky and North Carolina, Virginia, West Virginia. In uh, 1952, as a result of that, about 20% of eligible black voters were registered. That is African-Americans 21 years of age or older. 20% doesn't sound like a lot until you consider the fact that as recently as 1940, it had only been 3%. Now, was that a result of apathy on the part of black people? Hardly. Rather, it was a result of the fact that uh, it's a combination of you're taking your life in your hands if you're black and you registered to vote in the South in the 1930s, and you also were probably very cynical and pessimistic about your vote really counting or, or mattering that much. So it might have seemed like you were risking your life for next to nothing. So that's a pretty big, pretty big improvement, 20% by 1952. In that same year, 1952, for the first time since statistics had been kept, and statistics started being kept in 1866, the year after the Civil War, there were no lynchings. Now, that's not to say there might not have been some murders, but there were no lynchings, no mob action uh, killings. So that's pretty significant. However, um, and we're, we're going to be seeing how uh, in the late 40s, early 50s, there were several moves forward in civil rights. But by 1952 and, and after that, it had kind of it had kind of cooled off because that's kind of the way that um, it's kind of the way we are as Americans. We have short attention spans. Now, there is a very strong connection between the civil rights movement and the Cold War beyond just the fact that they both happened at the same time. So take a look at this map that we've looked at before uh, that has all those uh, all those countries that uh, initially, at the beginning of the Cold War, or once they became independent and decolonized, uh, were independent countries that weren't on either side. And, and remember that both the U.S. and its allies and the Soviet Union and its allies were each trying to convince those neutral countries, mostly in Africa and Asia, to be on their side. There's a book that I often assign 
uh, in this class by Thomas Borstelman. It's called The Cold War and the Color Line, American Race Relations in the Global Arena. And I'm going to give you a super brief, super overview summary of the main argument and the point of that book. And it is this. Okay, bearing in mind what I just said, that the U.S. was trying to appeal to all of those decolonized new countries to be on the, uh, the American side, not the communist side. And many of those countries were in Africa and in Asia. Most of them were. Um, people of color, okay? Now, if you're trying to convince new leaders, uh, people in new countries, newly established, now independent countries in Africa or other places, that they should be on your side because you represent democracy and freedom and will be much better for them than the Soviet Union and communism would be, that you uh, think more highly of them than the Soviet Union and communism would, that argument is going to have a whole lot of holes in it if those very same people, if they visit your country, if diplomats from these new African countries come to the United States and depending on what state they land in, may not be able to eat in public in a restaurant with white people. You can see how damaging that would be to the argument that uh, the Western Bloc represents freedom and democracy. So the uh, federal government was particularly invested in the 1950s in trying to, in any way possible, roll back Jim Crow and segregation. Now, they wanted to do it usually without losing too many votes uh, because if you got no votes in the South and you're running for president or whatever, uh, that might make it challenging. But at the same time, you definitely, if you are Harry Truman um, or um, Dwight D. Eisenhower, who both came from states that were segregated, um, you want to be able to uh, make some changes so that you can be more successful on the world stage because it really makes America look bad. Now, we're going to look at some individuals who, who uh, broke the color barrier, who transcended the color line and, and overcame segregation. And we're going to start by looking at these three guys right here, three college football players. In 1939, these were the star players for the UCLA Bruins. Uh, from left to right, Woody Strode. Jackie Robinson, and Kenny Washington. So the California uh, team here, UCLA, um, they had an integrated college football team. These were the three black players, and they were three of the best players on the team. Now, um, as a college football team, they played other teams in other states, and they had to travel. Sometimes um, they traveled to segregated states, uh, and played segregated all-white uh, college football teams. When they traveled like that, uh, these three guys had to share uh, a room, usually in a separate, uh, separate hotel from the rest of the team. Uh, but they became very good friends when they were in college. And then they graduated, and uh, all three of them, I think, wound up serving in the military in World War II. I just checked, and yes, all three of them served in the military in various capacities. I guess that's one of the advantages to doing class this way. So, anyway, uh, Kenny Washington served in the, uh, uh, he was on a USO tour. That was an uh, uh, organization, an army organization that uh, entertained the troops. Uh, and so uh, he was on that tour playing in exhibition football games combat troops, um, Woody Strode joined the Army Air Corps 
and wound up uh, in the uh, Pacific, in the war in the Pacific, Guam and places like that, um, where he worked loading bombs onto the, onto the planes. Uh, and Jackie Robinson applied to and was accepted to one of the uh, few black officer training schools. And he, uh, he went through that officer training school and was commissioned a second lieutenant in the 761st Tank Battalion, which was uh, an all African-American um, tanker group. Uh, however, he never got to be uh, he never got to be deployed overseas, even though that battalion went on to see combat. Because uh, in 1944, uh, it took him a while to get through the officer school. Obviously, um, he was uh, getting on. Um, he was on a bus traveling because he was having a, an ankle injury from uh, his football days uh, examined, and it was an army bus. And army buses were supposed to be desegregated, even though he had been uh, assigned, uh, his battalion was assigned at that time to Fort Hood, Texas. So the army buses are desegregated, but the bus driver still ordered him to go to the back of the bus and he refused to do so. He refused to do so and was brought up uh, on charges of insubordination. Um, Eventually, that was kind of uh, argued down, uh, and it was just uh, basically uh, it went on the record that he was argumentative uh, with the uh, the bus driver and the investigating uh, MP, military police. So as a result of that, um, he didn't get to uh, uh, continue in the tank battalion uh, and in the war. So in 1944, he signed with... Uh, baseball team, the Kansas City Monarchs, who were one of the best teams in the Negro League. You see, baseball also was segregated at that time. Um, African Americans were not allowed to play Major League Baseball. Those were all white teams. They had instead their own separate but equal uh, baseball league. And he, uh, he played for uh, like I said, one of the one of the better teams. In 1947, the owner of the Brooklyn Dodgers, Branch Rickey, had decided that he was going to integrate his team. He was going to start uh, opening his team up to black players, which no one had done before in uh, Major League Baseball. And uh, he decided to start with Jackie Robinson. Now, Jackie Robinson was a really good player. He was not probably the very best player in all the Negro Leagues. There were a handful of players um, who were as good or better than he was, but each of them had potential problems with their temperament. Uh, some of them were known for being hot-tempered, and uh, Robinson had showed in his uh, in his situation with the military, where he stood up for himself respectfully, even though, you know, even though it wasn't appreciated by the army, but he stood up for himself firmly but respectfully. And so that's the kind of thing Branch Rickey was looking for, uh, what he thought would be necessary for the first black player to be in the major leagues, especially since he would have to be playing in southern cities where he would have, uh, doubtlessly, and it turned out that it turned out that he did, uh, very, very uh, hostile fans on the other side, more hostile than normal because because he was black. So most of you probably knew that. Most of you probably knew that Jackie Robinson was the athlete who broke the color barrier in Major League Baseball. You may not have known it was 1947. Uh, there you go. I'm telling you right now. It was 1947. And you probably thought that that's where our story was going to end, but it's not. Because the question arises, mainly because I'm making the question arise, what about the other two guys? What about those other two athletes, Jackie Robinson's uh, college football teammates, 
from the Bruins, Woody Strode and Kenny Washington. What about them? Have you ever heard of them? Well, you should have. And that's why I'm making sure that you do. Okay, so Woody Strode and Kenny Washington um, broke the color barrier in the NFL in 1946, the year before Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier in Major League Baseball. Now, there had been black players in the NFL before, back in the 1920s, 1920s when the NFL was established. However, by 1933, uh, there, were, there were none left. There had only been 13 total. Uh, by 1933, though, uh, there had been an unofficial color line. It wasn't a written rule, but it was an unwritten rule that uh, black players were not allowed. Uh, and there weren't any more for several years, for 13 years, until 1946, when Kenny Washington and Woody Strode were the first black players to be drafted by an NFL team, and they were drafted by the, uh, the Los Angeles Rams. And um, they didn't have long careers. Woody Strode probably, uh, well, both of them uh, had a big impact for the short time they were there. But, you know, they weren't coming right out of college, as usually happens. They had uh, gone from graduating college to serving in World War II to um, um, Woody Strode uh, had to work for a while as a, as a professional wrestler. Kenny Washington uh, played for various, uh, uh, I think he played for the Canadian, uh, Canadian football team for a while. So they were up in their late 20s by the time they actually got to start. But nonetheless, they played each of them for uh, two or three years, I think. And, and made an impact, but the, the biggest impact they made was just the fact they were playing and they were African-American. Now, they get forgotten. Uh, Jackie Robinson deserves a lot of credit for what he did. Absolutely. I don't want to take anything away from Jackie Robinson, but these guys, these guys deserve to be recognized as well. Now, Woody Strode actually... Um, strode through American pop culture in other ways after he retired from the NFL. Yes, he went into the movies and was uh, actually a, a very, uh, uh, very popular and, and often used Character actor, usually uh, usually in a supporting role, sometimes in the main role, like in the upper left when he played Sergeant Rutledge, the, the title role in a movie about uh, Buffalo Soldiers. Um, in the upper right, you can see him as a gladiator fighting Kirk Douglas in Spartacus. All the way down, all the way up to the uh, 1990s when he was in his uh, 70s, I think. He was still making action films. Now... If Woody Strode were to come up on a test, um, the main thing I want you to know about him is not that he was a movie star. Not that, hey, Woody Strode, yeah, he was in a movie with John Wayne. No, I want you to know that he's one of the two guys who broke the color barrier in the NFL and that he then became a movie star. Another thing that changed after World War II in America was that it was no longer socially acceptable to be openly anti-Semitic. Now, remember, back in the days of, uh, early days of Henry Ford and, and Walt Disney, uh, anti-Semitism was so common and so accepted that uh, it didn't seem the least bit unusual to see it expressed in public. And also... Uh, that contributed to, in the 1930s, quite a few people, not a majority, but a significant number of people in America actually liking Hitler, right, and supporting Hitler uh, until the whole World War II thing happened and the U.S. got involved and those, those concentration camps, 
were discovered. So all of a sudden, that fact, the, the way that people had viewed uh, Jewish people, was, was very, well, it was embarrassing, but it was more than that. Um, it was very disturbing. Uh, and it started to be addressed publicly, anti-Semitism started to be addressed publicly, not expressed, but addressed. Uh, and actually, in uh, 1948, two, two different movies, uh, big-budget Hollywood films, addressed anti-Semitism in America. Uh, the first one that we'll talk about is called Gentleman's Agreement, and it starred Gregory Peck. That's him on, uh, that's him on the right there. Gregory Peck played a reporter who had a friend, played by John Garfield, who was Jewish, uh, who was a, uh, a returning war veteran. And uh, his friend was telling him, you know, how bad anti-Semitism was and had always been in America. And Gregory Peck's character didn't believe him. He's like, oh, that's ridiculous, you know, because we've become enlightened and we've learned and uh, I'll prove it. So uh, the, the main character, the reporter, goes undercover as a Jewish person. He introduces himself to this, uh, uh, this new group of people, goes into this new town, introduces himself as Jewish, just to see how he'll be treated. And boy, does he find out. Uh, in fact, his own uh, fiance is humiliated that he's going around telling people he's Jewish and uh, she gives him a hard time. And he discovers that he is treated very differently indeed. And the whole point of the story, of course, is that that's wrong and should change. The other film is called uh, Crossfire, and uh, it stars Robert Young there on the upper left as a police detective, Robert Mitchum as a uh, Marine sergeant, and Robert Ryan as a, uh, a Marine private. I think he was a private, could have been a corporal. Uh, all this takes place, I think it was in Los Angeles. It was uh, right after... World War II. So the war is over. It was set in the uh, contemporary time. And what happens is that Robert Ryan's character is extremely anti-Semitic, just hates Jewish people. And he has a sidekick from Tennessee that uh, he makes fun of his sidekick's accent all the time and basically browbeats him into going along with him to bully people. And um, they encounter this uh, Jewish man at a bar, and, and the Jewish man has a nice watch, and Robert Ryan gets all upset, you know. Um, this is just wrong because I'm broke, and this, this Jew is rich. And so uh, they rob the, the Jewish guy and kill him. And then the rest of the movie is Robert Young, the police detective, and Robert Mitchum, the, the Marine sergeant, who suspects some of his men were involved in this, trying to solve, solve the crime, basically. Uh, there's an interesting, uh, interesting part in the film when uh, Robert Young is interrogating the young Tennessee guy, and he says, "Does does your friend make fun of you too? Does he make fun of the way you talk? Does he treat you like you're stupid because you talk differently?" And the kid is like, "Yes, yes, he does." And Robert Young says, "Well, you know what? There was uh, there was an Irish man one time who was an immigrant who came here to this new country." And people made fun of him because of how he talked. And they hated him because he was different. And they beat him up and killed him. And that was my dad. Uh, so that brings in all kinds of different prejudices. But the point is, for the very first time in Hollywood, the uh, problem of anti-Semitism was being addressed in a real way. 